some of these young people fellowship are making sure they hit almost every hand in the church. That's the way it ought to be. Awesome. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we're going to ask the Lord's blessing here on the offering of the young men of Pentecost. I'm going to ask another people to pray for God. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you gave us, Lord. I want to pray for peace and for this year's right with Lord. I want to pray for this offering, Lord. You will bless it. And I want to pray for our missionaries and military overseas, Lord. Just going to pray for you. Amen. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> tempted sometimes to say, okay, where's that found? Someone say the verse or someone else say where it's found. <clears throat> At least get in the book. If you get the right book, it's that's a start. Of course, we'll be satisfied if you get the right testament to start with. And we'll build from there. So. <laughs> Anybody else? Did you get it? Yes, good. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Christian. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Lord for safety. Last Wednesday, uh, me and a friend of mine was going from Paris for us. And a little man was going to Paris for 
for a long, long road. And he was coming right towards us. We got over and he got by. I said, I want to thank God for safety. Yeah. And I want to thank him for being with Angel last Thursday, too. She could have been shot at the school because yeah. they had a shooter there. So just thank God for your safety. Yeah. Amen. Lord takes care of us for sure. And that reminds me, uh, she's talking about safety on the road. Timothy was telling me, of course, this is not something you want to hear from your kids as they're traveling up and down the road, but uh, he usually would come in from school because he has, he's in Georgia National Guard, so he'd come in from school and then he would get his stuff ready and then he drives all night to get in there, so he's been up all day. And he was telling me one time he was driving, he was so tired, and he happened to look, and of course he's on a four lane road and he sees some headlights coming towards him and he's just like, Am I sleeping or am I, am I dreaming? What is this? And he's just looking and, and then he realized that it was headlights and he swerved and somebody was on the wrong side of the road. I think it was a rider truck and uh, pulling a car or something. And he happened to swerve in time because he wasn't sure if he was just seeing things in his eyes just playing tricks with him or not. He said, I was awake after that. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, God does take care of us. And, and uh, you know, especially people who are on the roads a lot, uh, are, we have several truck drivers in here. You know, that's, that safety is an important thing. And I always need to thank God for it, uh, especially if you go on a trip or something. Joe, do you have one? Yeah. Um, sometimes I like to find myself getting caught up in the things that are going on today and the government and just the stuff we live in in the world all the time. But Proverbs 5.21 just reminds me, the ways of man before the eyes of the Lord. Yep. And nothing's catching him by surprise. He's got it all under control. Things look crazy to us, and just like, well, God's got it under control. He knew it was all going to happen anyway, so we just need to rest in him. And well, those are good. Yes, Steve. So I just want to thank the Lord. He's weighed on my heart the children mm -hmm. over the last several months and to seek the children to bring them to salvation and to church and that. And Luke. 18 16 says but jesus called them unto him and said suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of god yeah amen that's right and thinking of little children uh you know i think too spiritually you know spiritual children and i mm -hmm. wanted to mention this earlier and i thought well lord come and say something give me the time and that reminded me of it uh but, you know, as we have new folks coming into the church, and, of course, some of us have been here for a while. Some folks are still getting used to other people. But one thing we all ought to do is make it our personal ministry. Uh, you know, we have a fellowship, have a meal over there. Uh, keep a lookout, you know, for people who maybe are sitting by themselves or not talking to somebody or because uh, they don't know as many people as you do if you've been here for, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, they don't know as many people. And this is one thing we we need to do is make sure that we're always welcoming to other people and, and just you know, get to know them a little bit. If nothing else, just introduce yourself to them. And that will give them another face you know, that they can look, hey, I, I've met that person. And, uh, but that's a very, very, very important ministry. Um, a lot of people go to new churches, they get discouraged because nobody does come up and shake their hand. We, we tend to get caught up in our little world sometimes, and it's, it's easy to do. So just try and keep an eye out for that if you would. So, very good hand up. Yeah, I just want to thank the Lord that he answered my prayers also for traveling. Mercy's coming back with the, the pick there the other night. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, God's good to us. Anybody else? You want to take any? Yes. Anybody? I'm going to share mine from this morning, but um, we had we had guests over for the weekend, and so and they had young kids. Plus, with our young kids, things get crazy and when my house is a mess, my nerves get are shot. <laughs> I just can't function very well in a mess. And so Jared this morning was even like, because we were getting the kids ready, and the last thing to do was get Leela dressed. Her dress didn't fit like it was supposed to, and and so I had to change her again. Well, the night outfit didn't even match, right? And, <laughs> and so I was just frustrated, and I was like, she, like, goodness, she's seven months old. Like, it shouldn't matter. Like, you know, if her <laughs> shoes match or not. So, um, that sounds like a Jared song. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, but my house was also a mess at the time. And, 
and Jared was like, you know, was asking me what else I needed to get done, and I was just, I could, and the boys weren't exactly listening at the time. I wanted them to get their shoes on, well, you know, they didn't move, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I could just feel myself getting like my, my nerves were like, <laughs> and so I just prayed because I felt like it was, you know, I just knew it was the devil just working on my. Um, the peace in my mind. <laughs> you know, like, so I just knew that the devil was working against me, and and I just just knew that, and I just prayed about it, and I was able to, you know, just like okay, it's all right, we'll just get to church, <laughs> and everybody got in the car, and we was here on time. So. You know, when it happens, yeah, it's hard sometimes not to stress out over some of the smaller things in life. But what's your advice to tell you when I got here? Those crushing kids in the parking lot. <laughs>
me to the book of Jude, <laughs> chapter 3. <laughs> Some of you got that. <laughs> Where was that Look at Jude, <laughs> the Old Testament. <laughs> now Jude, and we're going to be looking here at verses 1 through 4, right before Revelation. This is the book of Jude. Jude is one of the half-brothers of Christ. We have Jude and then also James. Both of them wrote, uh, the Holy Spirit of God used those men to write a couple letters here in our uh, New Testament. <clears throat> Jude, and verse number 1, says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain for there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God, the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach a message here about how to contend for the faith. It's what God wants us to do in these days and times in which we live. We all ought to be contending for the faith, but how exactly do we do that? Let's pray and we'll get right into the message. Our Father, we come before you and just pray that you will, Lord, open our understanding and open our hearts now that we might receive the truth that you have for us, and then, Lord, help us to uh, be obedient to the things that we hear. I pray that you might uh, use us in a great way, Lord, to uh, further the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reach our Jerusalem and then our Samaria. And then, Lord, I pray that you help us also to uh, ultimately get to the uttermost parts of the earth. And, uh, Father, I pray that you will bless now and uh, bless our time together. Thank you so much for sending Christ to this earth to die on a cross for our sins. And, Lord, may we never, never get over that. May we always consider the sacrifice that was made for us. And, and Lord, remember what was done there on Calvary. And thank you so much for the suffering. Thank you for everything, Lord, that we can have eternal life. And Father, we just pray these things now and ask it all in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> well, Jude, as he was writing here, in verse 3, he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, he was writing about common salvation, but it is common only because we all get saved the same way. That's why it's common. He's not saying I'm writing unto you the common salvation that it's an ordinary or a mundane thing, just kind of ho-hum, ho-hum. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, it's common because all of us are going to get saved the same way. So it's common to all of us. Uh, it's not plain or simply ordinary. And then he says this in verse 3, he says, it was needful for me to write unto you. Now, the fact that it was needful, this means there's great urgency. It's kind of like I mentioned this morning uh, about begging and pleading. Oftentimes, the Bible will use terminology similar to that about uh, give diligent heed uh, or, uh, you know, above all things, give diligence. It talks about diligence or taking heed. In other words, uh, or I beseech you, brethren. That's another word that's used there uh, to talk about, I beg you, brethren, do this. You need to be doing this. And so that's kind of what he's saying here in uh, this book of Jude. He says it was needful for him to write. He's giving great urgency to this matter. And Jude wasn't just going to write about salvation. And then all of a sudden he changed his mind and said, no, nah, I think I'm going to write about contending for the faith. What he was saying here in verse 3 is basically, without us contending for the faith, we have no salvation. Because the next generation that comes after us, it's not going to be there for them. Someone has to contend for the faith in every generation. And this is our day, and this is our time. This is the time God has chosen to put us here in, hi in history. And the word contend itself means to stand 
with great agonizing effort. Some of you have asked if uh, we heard from Andrew, and uh, we did. We got a letter that uh, I think Thursday or Friday, and of course Andrew's Andrew. The first sentence in his letter is, "I'm in great pain," and <laughs> so <laughs> he continues on, you know, telling us some of the things that's happening. Well, we finally found his company. Uh, on Facebook, they uploaded some pictures, and we saw a picture of him, and, and he's standing there holding some weights. It looked like a dumbbell or something he's standing in, and he's holding these weights, and he's got like 50 pounds on this side and 50 pounds on this side, and he's just standing there at attention, and it's just like, you know, that doesn't even look like fun. You know, just be standing there. I don't know how long he was standing there, if he was doing squats or what he was doing with it, but, uh, you know, I was just thinking about him and thinking about the things that he's going through, and that picture made it look like he was in great agonizing effort, it's just standing there. And of course, he's got some sergeant or somebody just looking at him, you know. And uh, but that is how we're to contend for the faith. Sometimes there's going to be some pain involved. Sometimes there's going to be uh, some discomfort, but we need to contend for the faith. It is necessary. Uh, I mentioned before that you know when God emphasizes something in the Bible. Or when God stands for something in the Bible, we ought to stand where God stands yeah. on things. We ought to emphasize what God emphasizes. Uh, we ought to make sure, and, the, and one of the things that's near to the heart of God is seeking and saving that which is lost. That will be near and dear to our heart as well. That's why Christ came. So when God emphasizes something, are we emphasizing the same thing? Do we love what God loves? Do we hate what he hates? We need to make sure, as it says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 2, we need to be watchful and we need to strengthen the things that remain. We must contend for the faith. But how do we do that? Well, I'm going to give you three things here that we can do to help us know how we can contend for the faith. First of all, contend with convictions. Contend with convictions. It says here uh, in verse 3, Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Once delivered. In other words, we don't need a new delivery. We don't need a new system. We don't need somebody to come in and change how we do our worship service and all this to try to attract another generation. It was once delivered, and that's the same way we need to deliver. Just give the truth. We must contend with conviction. That's uh, one problem I see in churches today across America is there are people even standing behind the pulpits today that are so wishy-washy. They have no convictions. If you don't have some convictions about some pretty serious things, you're in trouble. You better be able to get up and say, thus saith the Lord. Because this is, as I mentioned this morning, this is God's word, and we have that authority because we have the authority of what God has given to us here. So it was once once delivered to the saints. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. His word does not change. His word, as I mentioned this morning, is forever settled in heaven, and there is still power in the gospel to Man. save. Yeah. He doesn't need, again, a new, new delivery, a new message, a new way of presenting it. Well, we just present it in song. Yes, you can present the gospel in song, but you better also present it in word and preach the word. Be right. instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And just in case you weren't keeping track there, two of those three things are negative. Reprove, rebuke, but also exhort with long suffering and doctrine. Two negatives and one positive. We need to make sure we are earnestly contending for the faith. I think of... Uh, He's retired now, but Kansas State football, uh, their coach they had, I think he retired back in 2018, Bill Snyder. Some of you uh, sports fans may be aware of this guy. But uh, Bill Snyder was not a flashy coach. Uh, I always admired Bill Snyder and his football teams. They were always very well disciplined. Uh, he coached for 27 years. He coached three different, he coached in the Big Eight, he coached Kansas State when they were in the Big 8, and then they transitioned over to the Big 12, and he coached there for a little while, and then he stepped down, and then he went back into coaching at Kansas State again for a period of time. But for 27 years, his first four years, he had a losing season. 
And then of the last 23 years, 19 of those years, he made it to a bowl game. That means he had to win at least half his games. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good uh, consistent track record. And 13 of those last few years, he was ranked in the top 25. Their team was ranked in the top 25. That's how they finished the season. Now, something that stuck out in my mind when I think of Bill Snyder and his things as a football coach, he never got the flashiest players. He never got the big four-star and five-star recruits. But the guys he got were well-disciplined, they were well-coached, and they stuck to the fundamentals of football. They stuck to the basics. They knew the basics, and they knew them well, and they did it. You say, well, what does that have to do with us as Christians? We stick to the fundamentals. We know the basics of God's word. We stick to them, and we just do it, and everything else seems to fall into place. Yeah. You don't have to have some guy, uh, you know, like I say, coming into a church and, and jumping up and down, yelling and screaming. There's nothing wrong with a preacher getting excited from time to time. And, uh, but you don't have to have a bunch of uh, hoopla and all this stuff to draw in a crowd. You just contend with convictions. Preach the word. That's what God wants us to do. We do it in our workplace. We do it in our homes. We do it in the church house. We do it in the marketplace. Everywhere God sends us, we need to preach with convictions. And we think about this. Somebody preached with convictions. They earnestly uh, contended for the faith for us. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to people who have contended for the faith generations before us. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul told the church in Galatia, uh, and I'm summarizing here, but he said basically you need to contend with convictions. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says this. It says, we also believe and therefore speak. You see, because we believe something, and we believe it, not just believe it and know it up here. We believe it here. It's kind of like if the building was on fire and we really believe it was on fire, we would be yelling with convictions, the place is on fire, get out of the building. It would move us to action. And that's what it says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We also believe, therefore we speak. We need to have convictions. We need to take a strong stand on Bible-based Convictions. Let me say that again. Yeah. Because there, there was a generation in fundamentalism, you know, 70s and 80s, and probably there's, I'm sure there's still some around. They take a strong stand on convictions. The sad thing is they're not always Bible-based. Yeah. Some guy preached the message, it sounded good, and, and people run with it, and uh, you know, therefore they preach it. I heard uh, there's one church I know of in particular, they... Uh, said that anybody who goes out soul winning, there is a special protection um, for soul winners. God gives special protection for a soul winner, and so therefore, you know, whenever teenagers would go out soul winning, they could just drop them off in the bad parts of town with no adult supervision, and they would be okay. I wanted to know chapter and verse. Where is that thing found? Yeah. Well, I got the chapter and verse, and it's completely taken out of context. That's not at all what it's talking about. It's not even talking about soul winning. And I started tracking this phrase down. Where did this originate? Well, it originated by a guy who had a lot of convictions. Uh, it was Bob Gray out of Texas. Had a lot of convictions, but was basically just a jerk. He was a jerk of a preacher. Yes, he might have led a lot of people to the Lord, but he also turned probably twice as many away. It's sad. That's not the way we're to contend for the faith. We must have convictions, but secondly, we must contend with compassion. We can take a strong stand on Bible-based convictions. We must make sure we are standing where God stands on things, but we must do it with compassion. John chapter 1, verse 14 it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ was full of truth. That's good. Conviction. But he was also full of grace. That's compassion. You see, it's important for us to have both. We must be full of grace and full of truth. It's not wrong to tell somebody that... 
well, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. That's not wrong to tell somebody that. But if we really believe it, it ought to break our hearts. We ought, not, we ought not say it to them in such a way, well, if you don't believe this, you're going to die and go to hell. And like, well, that's your problem. It ought to break our hearts. You see, the first way is speaking truth with grace. It's truth with compassion. The second way is just truth. No grace, no compassion. And we need to make sure we have both. Christ is full of grace and truth. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. We must have the truth, but we must have the love of God as well. Truth without love in any relationship, you can have truth all you want. And truth is important, but truth without love is a dictatorship. And people just end up getting angry. And I know some preachers over the years, they thought they weren't doing their job as a preacher if they didn't get somebody mad at them. So they would preach and preach and preach until they knew somebody was mad at them in the congregation. That's not preaching. You let the Holy Spirit of God do the convicting. If they get mad at you, it ought to be God doing the work and not you. It ought to be them getting mad at what God gave you to say and not because you were just being a jerk uh, to them while you were saying it. So truth without love is a dictatorship, but love without truth is wishy-washy and it always, always leads to anarchy and a very shallow view. That's what happens. A lot of people today want to stress the love of God. God is love. And that's great to stress the love of God, but you must also stress his justice. Right. That's why we see the anarchy we have today. People, they just don't care. They want to do their own thing. And it's because they want love without truth. So people who love God will also love those who preach the truth. And you know, when we preach the truth, and this is the thing, when you're witnessing to your neighbor and your friend and we're earnestly contending for the faith, and this goes along with compassion. When you're witnessing to them, they need to understand we're not down on sinners. We're not trying to knock sinners. We are down on sin. We are down on what sin does. It is sin that destroys. You might be talking to somebody who's uh, in some type of horrible relationship, you know, with, uh, or maybe they just uh, identify as, uh, you know, a bump on a, on a wall or something. I don't know. You know, people today identify with all kinds of things. But you can be talking to them and trying to witness to them, but we need to do it with love and compassion. And they need to understand we're not down on them because we're just a sinner saved by grace. They're a sinner. We're a sinner. But what we are down on, what God is down on, he is down on sin. Yeah. He is going to stress and emphasize the destructive nature of sin, and that's the same thing we need to emphasize in our preaching and teaching. I heard somebody say this when it was talking about, you know, we've mentioned about convictions. We need to make sure we have convictions. Convictions must be important. They must be Bible-based convictions. And we just mentioned compassion. And I heard somebody say this, and I thought, man, that is a good thought. And this is true, and I hope you get this, about putting these two things together. Our compassion should run as deep as our convictions. And that's pretty good when you think about it. Our compassion should run as deep as our convictions. We ought to be a people of convictions. You know, God says, thou shalt, and thou shalt not, and I'm going to obey him, and I'm going to do this and not do that. And we ought to have some serious convictions in our life, but our compassion should go just as deep. If it doesn't, then we're out of balance. And then lastly, how do we earnestly contend for the faith? We must do it with convictions. We must do it with compassion. And lastly, and again, we have to do, every generation has to do this, but we must contend continually. It's an ongoing thing. Our faith was once delivered, but truth must be contended for in every generation. God's truth has not changed. It was given one time, but it's somebody must stand for it in every generation. Well, I mentioned this last week when I was talking about uh, why we use the King James Bible. There have been people who have died so you and I could have a copy of the Word of God. They contended for the faith. They fought for it. They stood for it. They had deep convictions. They didn't care where the consequences led them. There were uh, preachers down through the years, even in our own country, back before we became a country. Uh, this is the time when the colonies and stuff were still here. There was a lot of religious persecution that went on. And there were people, there were Christians persecuting other Christians. 
uh, the, the Presbyterians would persecute uh, the people known as the Anabaptists or the Rebaptizers, which, were, which would be us, uh, because we only believe if you got baptized as an infant, and then you got saved later, you had to be baptized again by immersion because that first baptism doesn't count towards anything. So they called them rebaptizers or Anabaptists. And so they would persecute these Anabaptists. Why? Because they were preaching the truth. So these guys, matter of fact, I remember a story of one guy. He was locked in, he was having such an influence on this colony, they didn't know what to do with him. They were afraid to kill him because the people were so much for this preacher that they locked him into this cabin. They were trying to starve the guy to death, and he just had his uh, cabin had, uh, of course, it wasn't sealed up as a log cabin, wasn't sealed up uh, very uh, well, and so cold air would come in at night, and, and then it would get you know, hot in the daytime. He never had any blankets, never had any food, and uh, the people, the people of the colony and stuff would come around and come by his walls, and just through some of the little cracks in the wall, he would be quoting Bible verses out to them preaching to them the truth. And there would be people after people come by just to hear the truth of God's word. And he knew that because of what he was doing, he wasn't getting out anytime soon. And they were trying to think of ways to, to keep this guy quiet. So anytime they would bring this guy food, uh, they would put poison in it. They would do other things to try to make him sick. And uh, it was just one thing after another. But he kept contending for the faith. Are we willing to do as much? We must have some convictions. If we're going to contend, we must have some compassion, but we also must contend continually. Why? Because there are going to be men who are going to seek to change what other people believe to be true. <laughs> they want to change what we know to be true. Matter of fact, it says here in Jude, verse 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. They're crept in unawares. Over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, turn there if you would, and I'm going to wrap this up here. Just two passages. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. There's always going to be somebody who's going to fight against the truth. I almost mentioned this this morning. As the devil has always tried to destroy God's word. He's always tried to keep the truth from being uh, presented in a Christ-like way. Uh, even uh, you know, back in the time of World War II... And they were burning Bibles. You know, uh, Nazi Germany was trying to destroy the Word of God. Uh, Russia was trying to destroy the Word of God. But guess what? God's Word stands forever. You can't destroy it. It's just going to continue to grow and multiply. And God's Word will be accomplished. It will not return to Him void. But 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says this. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So who's an Antichrist? We put them in political office all the time. All the time. There are so many people against what is uh, Christ-like. What against, uh, they're against what is true, what is biblical, uh, and they come sometimes in just little subtle forms. There's people that have been placed on the Supreme Court that at, at one time people thought, oh yes, we'll get somebody here who stands for the Constitution, and come to find out they have their own little agenda, they're not for life, they're not for a lot of other things, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, and uh, they happen, they pop up everywhere and because they're trying to pervert the truth. Either they are trying to do it or they're being used of the devil to do that. There are many antichrists. That's why we know that we're in the last time. Verse 19 says, they went out from us. That's scary. That means they were a part of them for a little while. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. They were once numbered with the Christians and these people who creep in unawares is so very subtle, so very subtle. But you know what? If all of us together, with love and compassion, and we do it continually, and we earnestly contend for the faith with Bible-based convictions, and we do it as a body, you know what will happen to people who try to creep in unawares, the devil tries to get into our midst? They're going to feel so uncomfortable they won't stay. That's what happens. We must earnestly contend for the faith. As a body of believers, we must do it individually. 
but we need to do it as a body of believers as well. These people who seek to change what others to what others believe to be true, they creep in unawares, and also the Bible says that their condemnation is foretold back in the book of Jude in verse 4. It says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That word ungodly means without reverential awe. It's just they, they flippantly address the things of God. They handle, they treat it very lightly. We better realize we are on holy ground. And when I say we're on holy ground, the Bible talks about us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the temple of the Holy Ghost. We, God is living within us. And that's a very, very important thing. We have to have some reverential awe. And we better be very much in tune with that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. And be constantly and instantly in prayer. Lord, is this what you want me to do? Is this what you have me to get? Is this where you have me to go? Is this what you have me to say? And we need to make sure we are constantly doing that. Because God will lead us. But there are ungodly men. The Bible talks about uh, the wicked. That God is not in all his thoughts. I don't want to be in that crowd. I want God to be in all my thoughts. But these ungodly men means they did not have any reverential awe. And then it says, talks here about the grace of our God. This is salvation. It says, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, what that means is this. That word lasciviousness means without restraints. In other words, you say this prayer, you'll get saved. That's without restraint. That's not what the Bible teaches. Nowhere does the Bible teach a prayer is going to save you. The Bible teaches that you have to pray, but you better have faith in your heart. You see, we must believe in our heart and then confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. But they turn it into lasciviousness. Or they say, well, uh, all you have to do is some religious act. You just have to get baptized. You just have to join the church. Or you just have to do this or do that. And it's without restraint. Or, well, God loves us all. We're all going to heaven. They've turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And then it says there also that they are denying the God of the Bible. They make God into what they want him to be. And the Bible tells us when we see people like that, we need to mark their conduct. The last place I want you to turn is Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. <clears throat> we need to contend continually. We need to do it with compassion. And these people, I say this oftentimes, they're, oftentimes they're good people. They might be well-meaning people, but when they preach or they say something that is wrong with compassion and with Bible-based convictions, we need to make sure we expose them. We be led of the Holy Spirit. Pray for His timing. God will give you the timing. Somebody says something and you right away notice it's not right. Lord, is this what you want me to say? You want me to say this right now? And especially if they are a leader of people, they need called out on them. They need to they need address. If I ever say something to you that's unbiblical, I would trust and hope, not just one of you, but many of you would call me out saying, you know, preacher, you said this, and I'm sure it would probably be something coming out of my mouth that was not in my mind. That happens frequently. But, uh, you know, I would want to correct it because I want to make sure that what I'm saying is true. Romans chapter 16 and verse 17 says this. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. These are people that is like, man, that's that's a good preacher. Great preacher. Could be somebody, hopefully we never have anybody in this pulpit that's like that, but I've heard some preachers like that. I heard a guy get up and preach one time and spent 30 minutes preaching a message about the little boy's lunch, the five barley loaves and two small fishes. He spent 30 minutes preaching about how his mama got him that, you know, that meal for that day and all the preparation that went into it. And, and I'm sitting there the whole time thinking, this is nowhere in the Bible. Yeah. And the stuff and the points he was bringing out, they might have been able to make spiritual application. And the truths, some of the truths he was saying can be found in the Bible. But he was totally butchering that passage. That is not at all what that passage was even talking about. And I was sitting there thinking, 
And there were so many amens going up for this guy. Amen, brother. Amen. And I thought, the simple is all around me. Their hearts are being deceived. This is not good preaching. And that guy's pastor in a large church up somewhere, I think up in Michigan. And uh, I just thought, how sad. How sad. We need to make sure we are contending for the faith. We're doing it continually. But we need to make sure we are preaching the truth and we're convicting our, our convictions, our Bible-based convictions. And then we preach with love and compassion. We're not preaching excitedly that somebody's going to die and go to hell. Our hearts are broken when we preach such things. I hate preaching on hell. It kills me to preach on hell. Because I think about the reality of it. I think about the, I was, as we were driving up the road the other day, and uh, just, it was unbelievable going through Pittsburgh and, and just seeing people everywhere. Everywhere. And I thought, this is one little section of one little state and one little country in this part of the world. People everywhere. And they're dropping like flies. And where's the gospel witness? We're losing them quickly. If we don't tell them who will, if we don't contend for the faith, who will? This is our generation. This is our time. And it's time for us to earnestly contend for faith. Do it with Bible-based convictions. Do it with compassion. But let's do it continually. Let's all stand. We'll have a word for you. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures and thank you for your love and your goodness to us. And Lord, I pray, this is a, a battle, Lord, we have continually in our workplace, in our families, uh, our friends, our homes, our acquaintances, our neighbors. Lord, just people all around us, help us, Lord. We need your help to contend for the faith. We need to do it in every generation. Lord, each and every one of us, no matter how young we are, no matter how old we are, there are people around us. We must stand up and speak the truth and do it in love. And then, Lord, we need to keep at it. We need to not do it for a period of time and then let up. But we need to keep the hammer down until you call us home. Just keep on contending for the faith, keep on standing for the truth, and keep on doing what's right. God, I pray that you will help us to be able to say, as Paul said there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he had fought a good fight, <coughs> that he finished his course, and that he kept the faith. God, help us to finish strong. Help us to finish well. And Father, I pray that you will bless in this invitation time now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 252. 252, as we sing a few verses here, God spoke to your heart, won't you come? Step out right where you are and just do business with the Lord. Amen.
let's still stick to the truth. And I hope you'll do that this week. And we're going to close here in a word of prayer. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And I hope you have a great afternoon. And as we close in prayer, I'm going to ask Dan if you mind dismissing prayer for you, please. God, I call Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity we had to be here today. Lord, we thank you for the services we have. God, I pray, Lord, as Pastor Priest here tonight, this afternoon, Lord, to us, Lord, we walk away challenged, Lord, to continue to contend for the faith. Lord, I pray that uh, your word will be received, Lord, and I pray that Lord, it's not something we just have fall on our ears, Lord, but it's something we actually apply and put in our lives. Lord, I pray we as a church will contend for the faith to continue to be a place, Lord, that a lighthouse on a hill as a, our church, Lord. So God, I ask you to be with us now, be with us as we leave, and keep us safe throughout our week. Bring us back next point in time. Jesus, I amen. God bless you.